Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video I am taking a look at the uh, AD&D 2nd Edition Players Option books. And uh, I'm going to begin with the one that I'm, I'm pretty sure is the first in that series. Uh, so I'll be taking a look at Combat and Tactics. And uh, this is not going to be a full deep dive page by page through the whole thing but um i will hit some of the points that really jump out at me as i'm going through it uh so a second note i do not have the uh the pdfs of these books uh but what i did find was i found a uh, website that has kind of like a flip book presentation of these so uh you know you can't print from it but you can at least view them in that way and so that's what i'm going to do with um that's what i'm going to do with these uh, as i go through them i found the the flip version of them you can get them on drive through rpg uh with a uh, through the pdf on drive through rpg sold directly from wizards of the coast and i strongly strongly encourage you not to do so uh because uh Wizards of the Coast has this thing with uh, all of the TSR products that they sell on Drive Through RPG uh, that they label them with a disclaimer, basically insulting the creators of the games, uh, insulting the players of them, and basically just uh, you know just castigating the. Uh, you know, the products of TSR, uh, regardless of IP, uh, and and labeling them as being, you know, bigoted, prejudiced, and, and worse in some cases. So, um, again, you can get these on, uh, on eBay. You can get the hardcovers on eBay. Most of them for less than $40.00. Uh, on eBay, if you're lucky, you can get them for even cheaper than that in some cases. Uh, they are a lot cheaper than any hardcover that Wizards of the Coast is going to sell. So if you want to put it into that kind of a context, it is actually cheaper now to buy uh, older editions of Dungeons & Dragons on eBay uh, in many cases than uh, buying new products from Wizards of the Coast. So... Without further ado, uh, let's get on to taking a look at Combat and Tactics, the first of the player's option books for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, second edition. So as I said, so this is called Any Flip. Uh, this is the website where I got it from. I will go into full screen here so you can see the uh you can see it as i see it i can have all the full controls over this to zoom in and such <clears throat> so i'm basing that this is the first of the series because this one is numbered 2149 the next is 2154 and the last is 2163 so i wanted to take a look at these going the you know going at them in order that flipped fast. So uh, as you can see that these these flip just like a regular book does. And I, I do have the hardcover. I will show you that um, so that you see that I do actually have this in my collection. And so this is a player option, combat and tactics. Uh, you can see uh, signed off. Uh, the forward is by uh, Rich Baker and Skip Williams who were the two primary contributors of this. Um, yes, so they're the design leads on this here. And oh, let me, uh, let me zoom in and see how we can scroll this. Uh, I haven't used this for this presentation, but it's actually really quite big, so that's great. So um, does this belong in my campaign is the first that we're going to go into so this is just chapter one and uh it's going to talk about battle maps and um and figures and such scale uh the combat round combat status 
uh, threatened and so forth, grappled, movement, uh, movement rates, uh, base movement, exceptional abilities and movement, strength, dexterity, encumbrance, uh, simplified encumbrance, opening the battle, just hitting the five basic steps. Uh, step one is monster action, determination. Step two is player action, declaration. Step three is initiative. Step four is resolution of actions. Step five is uh, the end of round resolution. And then we go into uh, further details on initiative, combat actions, non-move uh, non actions, half move actions, full move actions. Uh, so you're starting to see how it's um, the action economy basically is getting layered. It's getting differentiated. Um, that wasn't in uh, AD and D first edition. And for a lot of us who have been running AD and D first edition for a long, long time, uh, some of these rules and everything have kind of bled into our games just over these many decades because, uh, you know, second edition did follow and and when I have new players coming to my table and they've been playing at my table for a long time, you know, after, you know, a regular campaign for me, which is anywhere from the minimum of like eight months to as long as a little over two years now, um, in my current campaign, a lot of second edition tricks and, and tips and, uh, and changes to the rules are making their way into even my game as well. So, um, you know, these are things that you might see the you know, the initial seeds of them are right, in your own game, even if you're playing an older version than this, all right? And that's just because there's a, just a natural, uh, if something works better, you're going to end up using it at your table. At least that's what I would recommend as well. So moving on through, we're still in chapter one. So you can see it's a pretty extensive chapter. Um, Choosing actions, so jump right to this so you can attack, cast a spell, charge, cover, uh, fire, throw, uh, or throw missiles, guard, move, parry, run, sprint, unarmed combat, use a magic item, or withdraw, all right? So some of these, again, are new for second edition. They, they were not in, um, not all of them were in a d and first edition. Uh, so retreats and fatigue keeping track of fatigue, the effects of fatigue, and so on, morale. Um, now, first edition had morale. In many cases, we kind of ignored it, um, or at least my particular group ignored it, you know, quite often. Um, players kind of control the morale of their characters. Uh, special combat and DMs control the morale of the monsters. You kind of make it happen when it makes sense to happen. Special combat conditions, so AD&D rules, movement and footing, cover and concealment, mounts, and so on. We keep on going through, sitting, kneeling, and lying prone, damage and dying, weapon type versus armor type. Uh, that's something that is generally uh, discarded, uh, just from my own point of view. Firing into melee, that's something that I almost always do. Uh, <laughs> so always a chance only on fumbles but uh, additional rules high ground knockdowns critical hits uh, the gray areas I'll be interested to take a look at that and then example of combat so that is going to round out chapter one so let's start taking a look at chapter one and we will go to um, does this belong in my campaign so let's take a look at this uh, this one statement here. Player's option combat system is an integrated set of rules that dovetails with the latter chapters in this book. However, you don't have to use this chapter in order to make use of the other systems. This chapter presents several new combat actions, restructures the AD&D initiative system, and introduces 
retreats, fatigue, and critical events. Most of the material assume, assumes that you will use these rules with character and monster miniatures on some kind of a map. If you don't want to run combat like this, you'll still find that the new initiative system and actions can be used without any figures or maps at all. So this is the one, one of those things in second edition that, um, that oftentimes generates some commentary that it is not true D&D or it's, it's too focused on the miniatures game. Uh, and, you know, that's something that I want to get into a debate in tomorrow's live stream that I'm planning on having. Uh, that, um, you know, this is something that comes up that, um, that the, the opposition to second edition, you know, those that dislike second edition, this is one of those things that they point to. So we're going to take a look at it and see how that, um, that addresses it. So the combat system, so the bat battle map, and they go into figures and facing, and you can see that this is really delving into the miniatures game, all right? Um, which, if you're into it, that's great. If you're only like going to use like a hybrid model of this, just so that you can give a visualization of where the characters are at and and so forth, without going into facing and, and the modifiers that might go with facing and such, you can do that as well. Um, or if you want to do strictly theater of the mind, you can disregard this and, and move on from it, right? So, but you can see um, there's a variety of skills and, um, and calculations that you're going to do based on issues of facing and distances and, and, and whatnot in this combat system. Uh, combined scale, so the shaded squares are missile scale. Note that the dice have been used to mark the borders between missile scale and melee scale. So again, you know, very, very interesting, um, very, um, very skirmish role-playing game uh, kind of setup here that you're seeing here that's very reliant on using uh, figures. Uh, so using the miniatures to, uh, to conduct the combat in Dungeons & Dragons. We go into movement rates, and so here you have your movement rates that are the base movement rates. So humans can move 12, half-elves and uh, elves move 12, dwarves, gnomes, and halflings will all move at 6. Um, Half-orcs weren't initially in this version, but they, they come in later in a, a, another player option booklet, so um, that's why they're not listed there went fast. So, sorry, went too fast. Combat system, so we have the strength. Um, strength is going to, uh, here's the encumbrance category, so the effect of encumbrance on base movement, so they have a chart for this here. You have a simplified encumbrance that you can utilize. Um, Surprise, so surprise here is, um, let's see how it changes. Uh, so surprise check is done on a D10. <clears throat> so that's different from what I do in uh, AD&D first edition, just using the D6. Normally a group of surprise on a roll of one, two, or three. The surprises get the free round of attacks, movement, and spells against the surprise members of the other group. All right, so, um, and you can obviously have competing surprise roles. So if both are surprised, um, it's the same thing as having uh, um, equal initiative uh, for that particular round. Uh, encounter distances, you know, so 
If both groups are surprised, it is d4 squares. If one group is surprised, it's d6. No surprise is, uh, you know, is uh, no modifier. Or um, if you have smoke or heavy fog, it's d8. Jungle dense forest, it's 2d10. And so far, I really like this. This is something that, um, you know, I, I think is missing from AD&D first edition is to give us kind of like what is the range that encounters take place. Um, so I, I do like this, that it's, uh, it's here and it, it's a very simple system to use. Five basic steps to every combat. Uh, step one is the monster action determination. And, and the reason why that you're doing the monsters first is because you're the DM and that's who you're controlling. Usually, they are the ones that are, um, let's say, in their lair and they're doing their normal routine of, of moving around. You should never have a static lair. Uh, you should have a living, breathing lair. So the monsters are almost always on the move doing something, whether they're patrolling or doing maintenance on the dungeon or delivering, um, delivering items from one area of the dungeon to the other. Uh, then the, the PCs, once contact is made, then the PCs are de going to declare their actions, and then you'll roll initiative. Yeah, and so it, it actually relays that before I even write it. Um, I kind of suspected that's what it is. Before the players announce what their characters are doing this round the dm secretly decides the actions of the monsters take once the dm decides what the monsters will do he should stick to uh stick by it he's on the honor to not switch actions after learning the player's decisions right so you're gonna basically have the monsters doing what they're going to do and then the players declare what they're going to do the monsters are still following their uh their actions regardless of that declaration because they don't hear that declaration happening right um then the players are going to act and then the monsters will naturally respond to that in some way depending on who has initiative and such um that's how that goes uh let's take a look at initiative since i brought it up um Timing is everything in combat. Does a fighter try to get in a quick blow before his enemy can react, or does he wait for a better opening? Who gets to go first when the barbarian warrior is trying to cut down a mage casting a spell? The initiative structure presented here is designed to answer these questions and provide your character with better alternatives for combat. All right, again, initiative is using a d10. Uh, very different from before. Some initiative rolls provide unusual results. A roll of a one accelerates the action phase for the side by one. So a slow character gets to go in the average phase. A roll of a 10 slows the action phase of that side by one step. A tie results in a critical event. Reroll the initiative die until one side or the other wins and then consult the critical event table. All right, so that's something very new for me as well. Um, so let's take a look at that. Let's jump to critical event table. And so if you're rolling on this critical event table, it's a D20. You could have armor trouble, battlefield damage, battlefield shifts, close quarters, item damaged, item dropped, knockdown, Lucky break, lucky opening, mount trouble, reinforcements, retreat, slip, and weapon trouble. Um, so let's see. Let's let's get a real definition of this. Strange strange things happen in the fog of war. Many battles hinge on a lucky break or an unforeseen complication in the player's option combat system. This is reflected by the critical event role. Critical events are provided to add color and excitement to the melee to create openings or opportunities that quick thinking PCs can take advantage of. Um, 
for the most part, I mean, they they appear to be pretty negative. Um, so, base initiative modifier for weapon speeds. Uh, magical bonus plus one, none, plus two or three, one phase. So they get to move one initiative phase faster uh, or act faster with a plus two or plus three and two phases faster with... Um, with their phases with a plus four or better magic item. Interesting. Nope. Keep on doing the wrong thing. Uh, armor trouble. So here we get into uh, <coughs> the specifics of what those mean. So an armor trouble is a helmet is lost, victim's head is exposed, a shield is lost or a plate lost, plus two to AC plate armor only. All right. Um, Battlefield damage, shifts, close quarters, and uh, two enemies that threaten each other find themselves inside one another's reach and are effectively grappled, all right? So you can have it where they're all of a sudden, they're so close that you, you're within grappling range rather than uh, just simply melee range. Uh, item dropped. Uh, which means the item is spilled, dropped, or cut free from its owner's person. All right, so items damaged. A random combatant has something damaged by a wild swing. Choose anything except a weapon and roll an item or saving throw to see what is broke. Um, a lucky break. Random combatant is favored by the fates and gains a plus four bonus to his armor class and saving throws for this round only. A lucky opening is going to give him a plus four to uh, the attack rolls. Uh, and uh, mount trouble, you can understand probably what that is going to be. Uh, retreat, uh, the press drives back all threats uh, figures uh, of one side or the other. Uh, see retreats below. I'll go into more detail with that um, some other time. So... Non-move actions are, are no move actions. You can attack, cast a spell, cover, fire, or throw a missile, guards. Uh, you can guard something, parry, uh, unarmored combat, and use magic items. Half move actions, you can still move half your distance and then attack, charge, fire, guard, unarmed combat, and withdraw. Full move actions, you can only charge move, run, or sprint. You cannot attack in full move. Combat movement on the battlefield. And when I say battlefield, they also mean on, on whatever, you know, whatever tabletop uh, room condition or space condition that you're dealing with, right? So uh, this could be a 60 by 60 room. Doesn't have to be an actual battlefield or what they call a battle map is just where is the action taking place. Choosing an action, I don't think that I have to go into too much detail here. There's an attack, casting a spell. Um, casting time is, uh, so they tell you what the casting time is in relation to the phase. Um, so if it's only a one to three segments, it's fast phase. If it's four to six, it's average. If it's seven to nine, it's slow. And if it's one round or more, it's very slow. All right. I'm reading cover, you know, just very briefly looking over cover and such guarding uh, when a guard, when a character guards, she waits for her opponents to come to her. Guarding as a half move action, or no move action if the character stands her guard. A guarding character strikes the moment an attacker moves within guarding characters' threatening squares, regardless of their action initiative and action phase. The only way an enemy can attack a guarding character first is with a longer ranged weapon. 
If the Guardian character is attacked by a Charging character, the, car, uh, the character that won initiative attacks first as long range weapon other than, of course. Uh, Guardian characters are considered to be set for charge and spears and spear-like uh, pole arms inflict double damage against charging creatures. And they go through an example. So parrying, running, sprinting. Again, this is all um, some interesting stuff. Uh, some stuff is, is new, uh, but it's all pretty self-explanatory. Retreats and fatigue is something that is uh, new for here. When one character inflicts melee damage, but not a result of a missile combat on an enemy without being hit in, re in return, she may force her foe to retreat, driving him back with a well-aimed blow. So the attacker doesn't have to force her enemy back. She can decide to let him stand fast and not press the advantage. A defender can ignore the requirements to retreat if he is four or more levels or hit die higher than the attacker or if he is two sizes larger than the attacker. A retreat cannot occur if the enemy was knocked down during the round. Um, retreats are good for breaking up enemy battle lines or for maneuvering an enemy into a battlefield hazard. Fatigue, uh, fighting a prolonged battle on the, uh, can be exhausting and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's keeping track of fatigue, uh, effects of fatigue and recovering from fatigue. So um, that's something I'm likely not going to use. Um, you know, not unless I'm, I'm playing with a very small group and we can get into that kind of minutia of combat um, makes it makes it a little bit more manageable. As I said, I don't use morale as you can see here, and um, you know I let the players decide what the morale of their characters are, and if they miscalculate, they could get killed. And um, I determine as the dungeon master the morale of the monsters. I will have them uh, rarely fight to the death unless they're fanatical. And, um, and typically speaking, once you've eliminated half their number, some of the weaker ones are going to start looking, or the wounded are going to start looking for uh, a way to get out of there. Again, unless they're near mindless, uh, or they're, um, they're fanatical. Cover and concealment, so you, you have modifiers for cover and concealment. You have modifiers up here for movement and footing. Um, so reduce on the movement uh, inches that a character can do. Um, mounts, uh, rear and flanking attacks, and sitting, kneeling, and lying prone. Firing into melee. Uh, to determine the actual target, each uh, assign each man-sized target one point on a die. Small size targets get one half a point, large two points, and huge targets get four points, and gargantuan gets six points. I'm, I'm guessing you're using a d10 for it. Um, Not sure. I don't know how they get just one half, one half uh, on the die roll. So small targets are confusing me. Um, hopefully somebody can point out how that works. All right, gray areas. So and now they do like kind of a like a recap. They're showing you the diagram how everything is supposed to be moving all the way through and there we have combat system chapter one for
utilizing the advanced Dungeons and Dragons players option combat and tactics. So just going to cover chapter one today and um, and I'll see I'll take a look at the each chapter. I may not do a, a video for each individual chapter. I might skip over some chapters or um, better yet I might um, I might uh, let's let's get back to here. I'm sorry. I might um, I might also ask for um, you know for your input. So you could say, all right, chapter one is is taken care of. Let's take a look at um, let's take a look at uh, chapter four instead of chapters two and three or whatever. So I will uh, certainly uh, gauge your requests and and determine you know which ones. Uh, which ones either came in first or which ones are the most uh, frequent that have come in. And then that's how we'll break down uh, doing these videos on this. So uh, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for uh, stopping in. Uh, I'm really enthusiastic about the, uh, the amount of views and comments that are coming in for uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, including more subs. So... Um, you know, I've had a little growth spurt here of subs coming in to take a look at uh, second edition AD and D. Uh, so it's really encouraging to see uh, how many people are still really enthusiastic about this edition of Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, happy to keep on producing videos for you uh, to take a look at. You all have a great rest of your day. Take care. I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen sometime soon uh, or at a convention. Uh, I was just looking at the details of a October convention. So um, <clears throat> maybe I will take a look at that. And uh, it, it's a possibility. It depends on where it is. Um, but uh, if it's local, then I will. And local means within like 10 hours. Uh, then I will uh, certainly consider it. So you all have a great day. Take care.